Okay, shall we get started then? Thank you for coming. I know more will join us as we move on, but uh, thank you to all of you who are online. I hope you can hear us. Um, I don't know if anybody can. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure that I'd like to introduce our speaker. But before that, I'll just introduce the department and myself so you get a sense of what, where we stand. This is part of our public lecture series, and this is the second one for this term. And I'm Shonali Nag, I'm the professor of psychology and education here. I'm very personally interested in the topic uh, for today because of my work in India with the education bureaucracy and education reform. Uh, but the person we have with us, Akshay Mangla, has been someone who's carved a very special place in the scholarship about. Indian bureaucracy and public services. Um, I will come in a minute to what he's going to cover, which is linked with education, but I'd like to give you a sense of his accomplishments, although I won't cover all of it. Um, he is the Skoll Center Fellow at Oxford. He was the Global Research Fellow at the Harvard Business School. He has won the World Bank Marketplace Award for his work on policing and an innovation in terms of having help desks for women in every police station in India, uh, which from the kind of uh, difficulties it is to embed innovation is an innovation that had to be studied. Uh, Akshay is an associate professor of international business at the Science Business School. He's also linked with the South Asian Studies Center. Um, Apart from education, he's interested in police responsiveness, which is an interesting counterpoint to education as a public service delivery system. Uh, he's interested also in inter, uh, institutional activism. I was interested in one of his reports, which was on preventing child labor in the UP carpet belt, having myself worked with attempting to prevent child labor in a, in a context where Children's fingers are the best for the industry because they do the work better. I was working with cotton picking, which is a similar kind of uh, driver for why children are recruited. Uh, his recent book, uh, which is available here, and I have the leaflets uh, that um, Akshay brought for us, it's on making bureaucracy work and the issues around norms and informal rules and what does it mean to have a public delivery system? Uh, he's worked across India, but he has a wider interest in low and middle income countries. He's been supported by various funds, uh, particularly those that are interested in low and middle income country public service delivery. A uh, word about his hobbies. Uh, He's into martial arts. He says he hasn't done it for a while. <laughs> He's into tabla, which is a form of drums that comes from India, which he says sits in his room staring at him because he hasn't touched it for a while. <laughs> we all recognize this, those of us who have our hobbies and haven't been able to pick it up. And he's into photography. The topic that he's going to cover is put up here. Our plan is to have him present for the length of time he'd like to, and then we'll open it up for question answers. So if you could just keep your question, then we'll ask it at the end. Thank you. Over to you. Great. Um, well, um, thank you, Sonali. That was very kind and colorful introduction. And um, thanks, all of you, for having me here and for coming uh, for this talk. Uh, I feel like a bit of an outsider and also potentially uh, oh, unqualified yes. to speak among a group that actually focuses so much on education. Uh, education is one of the service delivery domains that Can I you work just on. give me a minute? It says the camera is not turned on. Oh, I see. Um, I have no idea. Anybody knows what to do to turn on the camera? On the right, the right buttons. Camera, two, camera one or two? Has it come on for those online? Not yet, no. But we can see the slides, so. You can see the slides? Yeah. Okay, maybe it's an either or. <laughs> I promise you the slides look better than I do. So. 
Let's focus on the slides. Um, so like I was saying, uh, thank you. And uh, I do feel like a bit of an outsider in the sense that uh, I don't consider myself an expert on education. I think education is a domain that is really important for understanding a whole host of, of social and political issues. I'm a political scientist by training, and I see education as a site uh, where power gets exercised. Uh, and so I'm going to try to understand in this uh, in this talk, well, trying to uh, 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 persuade you that we need to understand how bureaucracy works to understand how education gets delivered in a place like India. Um, a bit about you know what kind of brought me to this uh, topic and this book. Um, and by the way, it's over here. I'm happy to kind of pass it around if you just want to have a look at it while, while we're chatting. Um, I had initially come in looking at non-governmental institutions and, and innovation. So, uh, I, you know, as Shunali was saying, I was looking at child labor in uh, eastern Uttar Pradesh. It's a, a very poor region uh, of northern India where uh, there's a carpet industry and there's carpet exports that happened and uh, large firms like IKEA were in that region seeking to find ways to prevent child labor. And UNICEF was working with IKEA. And at the time I went to study that intervention and uh, associated interventions around the management of child labor and supply chains. And these were mainly private interventions. And as I was doing the field work and I was talking to teachers, talking to parents, talking to NGO field workers, the state kept looming up as a key actor that was enabling or uh, impeding their work. Uh, if they wanted to scale up something they, that they were attempting a practice in a village, say, for example, uh, um, trying to uh, improve the school so that it was more embedded in a community and they tried to scale up that practice, they had to get license from the local administration and support in ways that often they did not. So uh, that really shifted my gaze towards the state, this, this big looming, you could say, black box uh, in terms of institutions in India. And I wanted to understand how does the state impact how uh, education gets delivered, and then also how citizens experience it. And then as a consequence, their own relationship to the state. That's great. Oh. Yes, now, now. But uh, the keyboard does not seem to be complying. Uh, so we need to get it back there. Um, oh, I see. Uh, it here. Ah, there. Yeah, yeah. Ah, there we are. Sorry. Apologies. So I'll just start with a puzzle. So uh, these, well, these are images of two villages. You can't see them too clearly, but um, hopefully uh, clearly enough. Uh, uh, and what, what this puzzle is uh, a reflection of is the variations that I observed within a region of India. So I was in, in, the, in the Himalayan region and I visited these two very uh, similar states, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. These are states that have uh, a similar size, similar population, a uh, similar social composition with respect to caste, uh, similar geography, uh, per capita income is very similar and a whole host of other factors that one would think would shape the quality of public services are more or less comparable across these states. Yet there's a divergence in education outcomes and how well education is delivered. And this divergence can be understood even with respect to these two villages I saw. In a sense, they capture the microcosm. This village uh, down here in Uttarakhand um, was a village that was predominated by upper castes. It was along a roadside, which meant that it's easier for bureaucrats to observe and monitor the school. And teachers prefer those postings that are along the roadside particularly when they're in a village, because it's easier for them to get in and out from the urban center, which is normally where they live, and then they go out to the rural area. So for a host of reasons, one would have expected education to function well in this village, and yet I saw a breakdown. I saw households trying to exit the government system and seek private schooling because the government school system was not responsive to their needs. The quality of education was very poor. Uh, compare that or contrast that with this village up here, uh, in the state of Himachal Pradesh, and Himachal Pradesh, again, just very uh, close by, uh, uh, you know, adjacent actually to Uttarakhand. And here, this was a village predominated by Dalits who were uh, kind of the lowest in the caste hierarchy. Uh, this village was actually quite interior. It was smaller and it was quite fragmented actually in terms of collective action. And yet, nonetheless, one observes, I observed a, a well-functioning school system where parents were committed to the government school. In fact, they were putting their own private resources in to complement the government school system and improve, for example, the quality of services, say the midday meal. So India has a national uh, program to provide a free lunch every day in the government school. 
And in villages in Himachal Pradesh, one finds the community much more involved in these policies and supporting state service delivery. So what, what explained this, this puzzling difference? And um, in brief, what I'm going to argue is that uh, it's not the formal institutions per se, but rather the informal norms, the unwritten rules of the game that really shape how public officials behave and relate with citizens. And these differences, which have uh, arisen historically across Indian states, have produced differences at the, in, the, in the contemporary period in the ways policies get implemented, and by consequence, the associated outcomes one observes for primary education. I'll unpack all of that in the presentation. Uh, now, the type of variation I observe is captured in this typology that I developed over the course of my research, and it's reflected in the theory in the book, where I argue that bureaucracies that are more deliberative, that is, they encourage much more discussion and debate internally and between frontline agents and society, are better able to solve local level problems and flexibly apply policies that are better adapted to community needs. And as a consequence, they get better buy-in from society and better outcomes. Legalistic bureaucracies, which are rule following, and they follow the letter of the law, and often what they do is uh, uh, protect their external boundaries with, uh, with society. Uh, they actually do a very good job, I observe, in terms of certain tasks that don't require societal input. So they build school buildings, but then they're very poor at actually encouraging the monitoring and everyday functioning of those buildings, which are more complex tasks that require societal coordination with the state. And so uh, I basically want to unpack this argument over the course of the presentation. These are just two states that I started out with. The book uh, focuses on four large states in India. Uh, you can ask, well, what can you learn from four states in India? Well, they have a population about the size of Europe. Uh, so let's let's begin with that. But also there's dramatic variation across them. And I think that variation can help us understand why policies are more effectively implemented in some places and not so in others, notwithstanding similar constraints with regards to resources and other things. So the rest of the presentation, essentially, um, I, I've, I've given a, a bit of an introduction, but I'll introduce the book a bit more, what I tried to do in the book and the kind of layout of the book. Uh, then I'll go into the sort of empirics of what it is I'm studying, the context, the policies, and then the design and methods I use to study implementation. So uh, primary education in India uh, is the empirical domain over which I uh, I developed this theory, and I use a, a comparative analysis across multiple levels of the state uh, to trace implementation processes comparatively between the different states I study. The puzzle of implementation, I try to, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll have a few slides just to uh, show you the kind of variation I'm talking about with respect to education outcomes. So you could just see uh, in, in a series of tables how, how large the differences actually are, even in this region, this kind of contiguous region of northern India. Um, I'll then uh, go into my argument, uh, the findings, and I'll conclude with some thoughts uh, on what the book's larger messages might be for research. I also have some conclusions for policy, and I know people here do care about that, so I'm happy to discuss that as well. Uh, so this is the book, uh, and I have the table of contents up. Uh, and uh, just to give you a roadmap of, of what the book does is I begin with a big, with a big puzzle of differences in, in implementation. And uh, what I'm trying to do is situate a, a set of arguments about uh, education and bureaucracy within a larger comparative politics literature. So this book is part of a series, a new series in, uh, in Cambridge University Press uh, called the Comparative Politics of Education series. And the attempt is to get people like me, political scientists, to study education. Uh, unlike our uh, friends in economics and sociology, anthropology, uh, the, the literature in political science is remarkably thin uh, on why, how, and under what conditions education gets properly delivered, particularly mass education. So there's a good literature in, in, in political science around, say, vocational training and higher education and how those systems of training and, 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 and higher education link to uh, uh, broader, uh, uh, you could say, institutions of capitalism. So how firm state and, uh, and, and educational institutions might, might relate. So for example, the work on varieties of capitalism finds that vocational training is much more invested in, in certain coordinated economies like Germany, rather than liberal market economies like the United States, where you find that it's much more uh, internalized privately. And so 
this is an attempt, uh, this book is an attempt to kind of add to that and really provoke more discussion and debate and see education as a core uh, state function and social service. So in, in, in the course of the book, I, I present a theory focused on norms and I'll, I'll talk about that here. Um, I also go into the history of uh, education and the role of the state in India and providing it uh, historically over time. And that kind of gets at part one of the book. Uh, part two is the meat, uh, which is to go from policy making to implementation. How do you translate uh, funds and policies and rules on the books into concrete practices and services on the ground? And I look at that uh, comparatively um, across four states. Um, so there's uh, four empirical chapters here. Uh, and each of the chapters kind of builds a different piece of the argument. So I start by looking at legalism, uh, what I described earlier of the rule following bureaucracy. In the case of Uttar Pradesh, a very large state in India, I then move to Himachal Pradesh, which I described earlier, uh, and, and look at deliberation and how that shapes policy uh, implementation. I then turn to Uttarakhand, which is a comparative state with Himachal Pradesh, and I look at how it is that uh, legalism has persisted in this state, notwithstanding uh, the fact that the, that the adjacent state next to it had a deliberative bureaucracy and what the impact of that is. And then the last piece in the sort of part two is to understand change in norms. And this is really difficult to get at, but I look at the processes through which uh, state actors at the elite level interact with street level bureaucrats, school teachers, frontline functionaries, and under what conditions they build commitment for norm change. And often I find that it's a process that's much more conflictual uh, rather than uh, uh, in a process of consensus. Now we have people in the room I know that study this uh, study the broad topic of education, but also bureaucracy, public services, and other settings. And I try to stretch the, my thinking in a comparative chapter, that's chapter eight, where I look at uh, to what extent can we think about the framework that I develop in other countries? So I look at the, well, other places. So I look at South India. So the book is mainly based on Northern India. And I look at the case of Kerala, which has gotten so much attention for being a high literacy state in India. And I argue that actually the, the, the bureaucracy in Kerala has not been, well, uh, has not been appreciated as one of the factors that's driving that difference. Um, so looking at Kerala, I then look at China and I find that deliberation in China, you would not associate an authoritarian regime with deliberation, but nonetheless, if you scratch beneath the surface, you find that there's deliberative pockets in the Chinese state uh, and that enables innovation and local level experimentation. Uh, and then I do a comparison of Finland and France. And I look at how the kind of political history of state development in the two different countries has supported uh, the emergence of different uh, institutions for managing school education and why you see such differences, particularly in inequality in achievement across the two countries. France showing some of the highest inequalities in achievement within the OECD. So this is based on PISA uh, uh, scores. And then Finland showing much less inequality in that achievement, which I suggest, and this is just a suggestive chapter, it's not my field work, so I don't want to say that the theory necessarily answers all these questions elsewhere, but I suggest that it can help us. Um, and then I end with rethinking bureaucracy more in terms of the sort of uh, future of research and also policy. So I take this big question about what makes bureaucracy work uh, especially for the least advantaged citizens. Um, and I think that that last clause, the least advantaged is really important because we have to think about the state as having a particular relationship with, with historically marginalized social groups. And education is a really important terrain to study that relationship because education can potentially challenge uh, this uh, societal status quo. So in the parts of rural India I study, uh, and this is kind of getting to the sort of narrower question that I try to operationalize, uh, is that uh, lower castes, women, and other groups that were historically excluded from education are now entering that space. And it's challenging social norms at the village level in many cases in rural India. So the bureaucracy in this very role of providing education is playing a part in social change. And part of what I want to understand is, is it supporting that process or is it uh, stalling that process? Are marginalized groups benefiting from that relationship uh, that the state is building with them or are they being impeded uh, in their social progress?
And uh, the puzzle, I guess, from a research design perspective is that I try to understand why even under the same national uh, set of policies, uh, legal constitutional framework, uh, the same formal institutional structures for bureaucracy, the same incentives, the same recruitment patterns, the same uh, training and promotion processes across states, do you see such wide differences in implementation? So a bit about the context. Um, so uh, education in India uh, is, is what's called um, a, a policy on the concurrent list of subjects, meaning that both the federal central government and state governments jointly have authority over how education uh, gets implemented. And the, the national government became much more active in the 1980s uh, around this. So uh, in 95, they passed the Midday Meal Program, which is the largest uh, child nutrition program in the world. Uh, the policies I focus on in this book uh, really emerge out of this period from the mid 90s uh, till about uh, early 2000s. So Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, which was SSA, India's Education for All program, uh, supported uh, in large part by the World Bank, uh, but then the central government took over. Uh, this is a program that provided a guaranteed infrastructure, incentives for children to attend school, training to teachers, and a more decentralized administrative structure. And it was pretty much widely adopted, actually. Um, and in 2010, India passed the, the Right to Education Act. This legislation is really important because it's one of the few legislations in the world that actually fixes a duty a legally enforceable duty on the state to ensure children in school. If you look at the sort of comparative uh, uh, you know, legal frameworks, actually it's often parents that are held legally responsible to send their children to school. So this is a policy area where the state has become very active. And this is to point out that uh, you know, the, the failures that we see uh, in education policy or in implementation in India is not just from a lack of political will at the top. So these policies are, are, are quite costly and, uh, and every year they're getting funded and they've uh, helped improve access to education to a large extent. So uh, India's crossed 95% in terms of enrollment rates. Um, more than a million schools have now uh, been constructed in villages and uh, 200 million children depend on them. Um, this is one of those schools. So this is a school I had, uh, I had studied in rural Uttar Pradesh. And you could see that notwithstanding the effort by, or the political efforts at the top, uh, getting policies down into schools is challenging. So the school was, uh, at, at, you know, uh, in, in many ways, an example where uh, resources were uh, being uh, provided by the center, but often not being utilized by the school itself. So you could see that there's uh, what's called teaching learning materials, which are painted on the walls there. But the teachers I talked to rarely use them. And students I, I interacted with could not read from the wall. Uh, and, and, and these are students that were uh, uh, covering a few different grades, mainly grades three through five. But it, it, it gave a sense of the fact that the policy making at the top is not always reaching the school. Um, yet one sees very big differences in this across states in India. So this is just uh, capturing one dimension of implementation. So uh, this is uh, the, the rate of school attendance, and it's a national health survey, uh, which asks uh, families, asks households uh, if uh, their children attended school in the previous week. So it's not just enrollment, it's actual attendance. Are you going to school regularly? And you see big differences across Indian states. I mean, the biggest difference that one notices and uh, one reads about is between the North and the South. So the South is much darker, higher rates of attendance, and you see this for other indicators as well. Um, I focus on states within North India because there's some variation over here that has been understudied. And I think it's important to study it. One, because uh, uh, the region isn't uniform, but two, from a research design perspective, we can control for a great many more variables when we uh, focus on contiguous states in the North. Uh, for example, the colonial history in the North could be different from the South, the land tenure institutions, the role of bureaucracy is very different. So I try to kind of look at states that I find to be more comparable from a political economy perspective and a historical perspective, and then try to trace differences across them. Now, um, maybe I'll come back to that slide in a moment. Let me tell you a bit of what I did uh, to get it understanding implementation. So I, I, I selected these four states. Uh, these are part of what's called the Hindi Belt region, uh, the region of India that's primarily Hindi speaking. Uh, it's poorer than Southern India and uh, more populated. Um, and yet here you do see differences. Now I said a bit about the national policy 
uh, uh, framework. Um, what I really want to focus on are subnational differences. So what I did was try to identify states that were very similar on certain factors and then varied. So the similarities are, are here in terms of selection, training, civil service conditions. And in each of the states, I, I conducted extensive field research uh, involving interviews, focus group discussions, ethnographies inside the education bureaucracy, uh, and then down at the village level, uh, ethnography of villages themselves and of schools. Um, and this was about 28 months of field research uh, uh, across the four states. And what I tried to do is uh, trace implementation from the state capital in each state down to the village and the school. Um, to do this, I also conducted structured comparisons. So within a given state, I selected districts that for theoretical reasons, you might expect there to be better or worse outcomes and tried to understand uh, similarities or differences across them. And I'm, I'm happy in the Q&A if uh, students or anyone else would like to discuss more about research design, how I got at this. Um, but I also wanted to account for rival explanations. So for example, I mean, one rival explanation you might think is that, well, education has less to do with the state and more to do with society. So I look at differences in village level social capital, the propensity for collective action, uh, the level of parental education, for example. Right, And notwithstanding uh, these factors trying to control for them, I still find differences that I think are important and they're driven by what I will argue is bureaucracy. Maybe if there are any quick hands or any clarifications, I, I hope what I'm saying is clear. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll proceed and say a bit about the implementation puzzle. So um, for one, I. I've, I've kind of told you a little bit about the, this puzzle over here. Um, and I'll, I'll say a bit about what the literature tells us about this. So, uh, so cross-national studies have shown that state capacity is a key determinant of a whole host of economic and social outcomes, right? And so this is literature uh, that looks at uh, certain features of a civil service. If it's more Weberian, for example, Weberian meaning does it have certain uh, uh, indicators that coincide with uh, Max Weber's uh, theory of bureaucracy, for example, uh, is selection uh, based on merit? Uh, are there civil service protections? Are salaries sufficiently high? Uh, and so on. Uh, these, uh, these studies try to show that that state capacity can actually, the level of Weberianness as one indicator of it, can lead to differences uh, in outcomes. Right. And so uh, understanding how the state implements policies is a key way to operationalize state capacity. Um, and here um, there's another literature I want to point out, which is uh, in the political economy of development uh, around uh, the, the developmental state. And uh, here the, the research has really looked at elite agencies that provide us uh, other kinds of uh, policy functions like industrial policy. So East Asia's rapid growth, particularly Taiwan, Singapore, uh, South Korea is often linked to the, the, the design of its uh, uh, high-powered uh, uh, planning bureaucracies, as an example. What I want to uh, kind of do in the book is push this literature forward by thinking beyond those elite agencies to think about mass, uh, mass services. So when the state has to provide education, uh, it's not enough to just look at the elite policymaking bodies, but you have to look at the frontline or street level bureaucracies that translate those policies into services. And that brings up questions of local level discretion. It brings up questions of uh, state society interactions. Uh, the further puzzle that, that I'm, I'm trying to address is that uh, from, from the theoretical perspective, um, a country like India uh, doesn't have a perfectly Weberian state. There's often politicization, like a bureaucrat can get transferred between posts for political reasons. And again, the political science literature on this tends to tell us uh, that uh, we shouldn't expect any implementation, or if there is any, it should be a very, very low quality if you have a clientelistic state, uh, a state that's kind of based on uh, a quid pro quo between voters and politicians, and the bureaucracy is just basically an agent of politicians. It doesn't have any independence or autonomy to itself. Um, and effectively, you expect health and education services to be underdeveloped. But this just raises the theoretical puzzle of how, how is it that policies ever reach the poor in such settings? And why do you see variation? Uh, even if uh, bureaucracies are similarly placed on scales of Weberianness and in terms of uh, the, the degree of patronage and so on. So 
One way I try to move beyond this literature is to uh, really open up how we think about implementation. So prior work has often in, in political science, and, and, and my apologies again for those who, who have a much uh, you know, broader, uh, you could say, uh, a base of scholarship uh, than political science, but I'm kind of speaking to that literature uh, in political science, which is relatively thin on this. But it's tended to focus on a single set of indicators. Often it's education spending and trying to explain that. Or there could be uh, uh, indicators like uh, enrollment or an indicator like um, the, the provision of school buildings. And they'll tend to focus on a single indicator and draw some inference about whether the state is capable or not. And what I try to do here is say, we actually need to look at a variety of indicators and we need to actually understand uh, the range of tasks that the services that the state has to offer. Because if you think about it from the perspective of a citizen, when you're seeking education, you're not seeking a school building. That's one thing you're seeking, right? You're also seeking uh, a, a, you know, quality education. You're seeking an interaction with the teacher. You want to maybe build some sense of community. I mean, there's a range of things that one is seeking. And if we only look at a single indicator, we'll miss a whole host of other things the state might be doing or not doing so well. So I basically uh, divide up tasks based on their level of complexity. And I'll, I'll show you in a moment my schema of tasks. Um, and I think the, the, the key variable or the key sort of a concept here uh, draws on the work of Eleanor Ostrom on Kovarnesh, that the most complex tasks uh, that's, that states engage in when they provide education are often not just provided or not just delivered by the state, but require societal participation and co-production. So for instance, uh, if you want to deliver quality education, uh, it's not only the effort of the teacher, but also uh, having good relations uh, with students and uh, their broader community. So that's society's part in the process of delivering education. But when we say that services are co-produced, it automatically should uh, alert us to the fact that different actors involved in co-production may, may be situated differently in terms of power hierarchies, particularly in, in settings of inequality like rural India, where certain groups may be better organized or have better access to the state or better, uh, or, or, or better resourced and so on. And we have to think about their conflicts in the process of co-production. Uh, now, I don't know if, uh, if, if you all can read this, but maybe I'll just walk you through the schema very quickly. I basically divide up the tasks that education policy uh, 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 entails, particularly uh, I, I operationalize this for the Indian context, but I think this can be pretty general, where I go from the least complex tasks that are fairly codifiable, you can write them, and they can be pretty much followed uh, from their written form, uh, to tasks that are more intensive to the most complex. And codifiable tasks are essentially tasks around provisioning of, say, infrastructure, hard inputs, providing textbooks, and so on. Um, intensive tasks require a lot more coordination within a bureaucracy. You might have to coordinate, say, with others in a different uh, state function. So, for instance, um, uh, posting teachers in, in difficult-to-reach schools, uh, the state bureaucracy in, in the center, uh, in the political capital, may need to coordinate with local administration to ensure that posting actually happens, right? Teacher training, yet another one, you might need to uh, coordinate with non-state actors that are able to provide that sort of training. So as you go down this, you get to tasks that require more and more interdependencies between state, uh, both within the state and between state and society. Uh, the most complex tasks are those that really require a lot of involvement of local community. So monitoring schools, ensuring that, uh, that, 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 that teachers are actually coming to school. So that's a big challenge in, in many developing countries, India, one of them, where there's high rates of teacher absence. So as you go down uh, this list, you go from tasks that are uh, less complex to more complex. And the more complex tasks are administratively and politically more challenging give you some indicators for each set of tasks. So these are the less complex tasks uh, and uh, the indicators are for access and input provision. And uh, this just shows you uh, how, uh, how well states are doing. These are the four states I'm studying. Uh, you see less variation in terms of enrollment across these states. Uh, you begin to see a little bit more variation when you look at things like the provision of a midday meal in school. Uh, one reason why that might be is because once you're enrolled, you're enrolled, and that's it for the rest of your uh, time in, in, in school, uh, at least at the primary level. Midday meals, is, it's an everyday activity. Every day you have to ensure that meal comes, and that could be one reason, just the challenge of the task. Uh, getting to more, uh, you could say, intensive tasks. Um, these are participation indicators and input indicators for, for tasks that are more 
you could say complex. So these are attendance rates, and you already see the, you know, the, the differences starting to come out. So Himachal Pradesh does the best. You go down the list, Bihar does the worst. Now, these two, these two sets of states are very different. These are in the, these are in the Himalayan region. These are in the plains. So I, I kind of treat them as, as different pairs for comparison, but just to show you that as you kind of go into the more complex tasks, you start to see much higher variation in how well the states carry these out. Um, and this is perhaps one of the hardest tasks, uh, ensuring students learn. Um, these are data, by the way, from uh, India's, um, well, from the ASER survey that's done annually. Uh, this is uh, done by an education NGO in India called Pratham. And every year they do, they've been doing for the last almost, I would say, is it 15 years? No, maybe more than that. Uh, uh, could be longer. Uh, they've been doing an annual survey uh, uh, testing students on basic arithmetic and, uh, and basic reading. And so this is looking at students who can read in fifth grade and students who can form basic arithmetic. Uh, two things to take away from here. I would say one is that um, even a higher performing state like Himachal Pradesh still isn't doing terribly well, right? Uh, uh, you know, only 72% of fifth graders can read very at a very basic, basic level. Less than half can perform arithmetic, but it gets much worse as you go down this list of states, right? Uh, a state like Bihar is at 45%. Uh, the All India average is also quite low, right? Less than 25% uh, of students in fifth grade across all of India uh, can do basic arithmetic. And this is like a simple subtraction that they have to do. So this gives you a sense that uh, learning outcomes are still, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done on learning outcomes in India. And that's where new policies have come up, but uh, just to give you a flavor of the, of the variation. Um, I said a bit about my methods, so I think for, for uh, you know, want of time, I'm just gonna jump right in uh, you know, to my findings. Um, and I began with this example uh, at the start about Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. And I think what I'll do is uh, walk us through this paired comparison. And if there's time, I might share some more examples. Um, so let me just, uh, why don't I, yeah, why don't I just walk you through the theory first? That might be easier than, than the other way around. So a bit about what I'm theorizing in the book. Um, I basically draw on a large literature uh, in, uh, in public administration, uh, political science, organizational theory uh, on norms. And norms are uh, unwritten rules. Uh, so while there's formal policy, the informal rules of the game are what instruct officials on how to interpret those policies, right? And how officials are going to relate with citizens in the process. So a couple of features of norms, they're unwritten, yet they're widely observed, right? Uh, they're learned over time through interaction between officials uh, and uh, through uh, everyday routine acts of approval and disapproval. So you look to your peers uh, uh, on how you ought to behave and these guide how discretion gets used. So officials at the front line, at the local level, have quite a bit of discretion in terms of how they're going to uh, understand and interpret a particular policy and norms help fill that gap. So uh, one direction through which norms shape implementation is action within the bureaucracy. So it, uh, norms will shape our understandings as a collective and our behaviors as a collective. But the other channel, and this is where society comes in, is that uh, citizens look to the state when they seek resources. They learn how the bureaucracy is behaving and they will adjust their own expectations uh, so for instance, if I'm, if I'm a mother and I come to school and the school teacher treats me badly, uh, then I'll learn not to interact with that teacher and I might seek help from someone else or I might learn not to go and talk to this, uh, that school teacher at all. And so in some sense, norms inside the state shape societal expectations. Those expectations can then impact behavior, collective strategies of society, and this together can shape implementation. And really the behaviors I'm interested in are local level collective action. Under what conditions do you get societal collective action to do the kind of uh, challenging complex activities of monitoring schools? Um, I theorize two distinct forms of bureaucracy. So I take this norms literature or I, 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 I kind of build on the norms literature, but then theorize different types of states. Now, the one on the right might be very familiar to us when we think about bureaucracy. When we think about bureaucracy, uh, going back to the kind of classic image, a, a bureaucracy is like a bureau. It's a set of drawers, right, that, that are hierarchically arranged. They sit on rails, right? And so we tend to think about rules uh, and we tend to think about a hierarchy, protecting uh, boundaries, right? And the, the important thing I think from the perspective of implementation 
is that uh, that a legalistic bureaucracy will tend to want to maintain boundaries uh, with society. So you don't want societal interference and incursion because you want to preserve your authority. And as a consequence, you end up prioritizing knowledge that's officially generated through your own written accounts and reports, and you might be less willing to listen uh, to informal sources of information or local level sources of information. Um, participation in service delivery will happen, but it'll often, it will have to be managed through official channels, right? You don't want society to just, to just incur uh, onto the state, you want to manage that process. So there are going to be official procedures and processes, grievance procedures, for instance. And what I argue is that this uh, type of bureaucracy generates a much more uneven implementation where you get uh, uh, the codifiable tasks, those of building school buildings and enrollment, those can get implemented, but the more challenging tasks where you need societal participation and you might even need local level information, uh, that often, uh, that gap uh, uh, occurs here. Um, this is contrasted with what I call a deliberative bureaucracy, which the orientation is less around rules and more around problems. And I build on a, a, a longstanding literature um, in, in political theory. So John Dewey uh, was, uh, was a pragmatist philosopher who influenced uh, 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 you know, current theorists of uh, 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 you know, deliberation. And he argued that, that, that public discussion and problem-based approaches to policy uh, can encourage a more flexible response of the state. And so I build off of that to develop this ideal type where bureaucrats don't just protect hierarchies, but actually encourage participation across them and uh, interdepartmental uh, uh, you know, types of interactions. Knowledge that's practical but unofficial may still get prioritized. And societal participation does not only happen through these formal procedures and official channels, but also a, a wider and more varied set. And this becomes important for implementation because it means that those who might be less powerful will have more spaces to interact with the state and, 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 uh, and express their interests. Uh, and as a consequence, what I argue is that uh, this orientation of a bureaucracy leads to an implementation process that's much more adapted to local needs uh, because the bureaucracy can take in information and respond to the individual needs of communities much more effectively. Policy implementation is actually much more tailored and customized. And as a consequence, you get higher quality services. Now, I'm just going to jump into findings. And can you give me a sense of how much time I have? I have time? Okay. So I'm just going to jump into the findings. Um, let me... Let me just give you some examples uh, first from uh, from the state of Uttar Pradesh. So in the book, I actually build uh, uh, the theory uh, starting with this case. Now, Uttar Pradesh is India's largest state. Uh, it has a history in Indian public administration, and uh, and really uh, the origins of uh, of legalistic bureaucracy here owe. Uh, uh, owed to the colonial period. So in the colonial period, there's a law and order state in UP, and the purpose is basically to maintain order for the crown. Uh, the district magistrate, which is a public official in UP, is actually in charge of practically everything. So the magistrate is in charge of providing services, is in charge of adjudicating disputes and so on. This becomes very important because it shows you already from the outset that public administration and law become closely intertwined that the same official is vested with so much power over, uh, over um, individual cases, but also over a whole host of policies. Now, in the, in the sort of um, a pre-independence period, UP, uh, the state was considered one of India's best governed. That might be surprising uh, to, to, you know, to people who are familiar with UP today because it's considered one of the most uh, uh, you know, misgoverned states today. But prior to independence, what was called the United Provinces at the time, not Uttar Pradesh, um, was uh, considered one of the best governed parts of India. This is from various reports of, uh, of state officials. Um, there was a reason why the military academy was placed in UP. Post-independence, this persisted. So India's National Academy of Administration, which trains uh, officers in the Indian Administrative Service. So the, the IAS is India's elite uh, kind of most prominent bureaucracy. It's a very uh, challenging uh, 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 post to obtain very hard. Very few people get it. Everyone is 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 trying to crack this IAS exam uh, across India, um, and so UP is the place of this. 
Um, UP is also very important in terms of uh, moving up your career as a bureaucrat. So uh, the most, um, you could say the highest post in Indian bureaucracy is the cabinet secretary. And, uh, and about half of cabinet secretaries since independence have come from UP. So just as gives you the sense of the state's political significance and administrative significance in the process. Now, uh, UP underwent massive political changes over the decades of, uh, after independence. And I'm just fast forwarding right now to the 1990s. Uh, we can look at the period even before that. But lower castes in UP began to challenge the, the hegemony of upper castes within the state. Um, this is a, a, a photograph of Mayawati. Uh, she was the first uh, Dalit and uh, female chief minister belonging to uh, one of the most marginalized castes in India. Um, and uh, she becomes the, you know, the first Dalit chief minister of UP and her politics is around dignity. So uh, this idea that uh, that underprivileged, under, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, less recognized groups need to gain some recognition inside the state. And importantly, she doesn't do away with this kind of law and order focus. As soon as she comes to office, one of the first things she does is try to uh, constrain the police force and make sure it's more responsive to Dalits. Uh, she also uh, tries to discipline bureaucracy, and this is to signal order uh, to uh, her constituents, but also to the wider public. Bureaucracy responds to this by trying to use rules to protect its sphere of influence and its authority. So uh, interferences from politicians and so on, uh, these get circumvented by uh, sticking to uh, uh, kind of state directives, uh, files, official procedures, and a lot has been written by anthropologists on the use of physical documents. Uh, uh, to kind of maintain authority within the state. And this is not just kind of, uh, you know, bureaucrats creating paperwork, like we, we, that's like the common trope. This is actually a form of power, trying to use paperwork to maintain discipline and authority over the, over the public and vis-a-vis and, uh, -vis politicians. Now, how does this play out in terms of policy implementation? Uh, what I find is that this tends to encourage a much more protective rule following type of bureaucracy. Uh, so the state officials will follow procedures, but they won't respond to needs at the, at the bottom coming from society. Um, and this tight adherence to rules, as I'll show in a few examples, ends up weakening local level initiative around education. So basically communities uh, become frustrated and over time detach themselves from government schools. So here's just one example. Uh, this is a government school uh, in Western UP. Uh, this is a district where the prime minister, where the chief minister, Mayawati, uh, had her political base. Uh, and as you can see, the school is built. Uh, it's, it's actually, when, when I went inside, I was impressed to find it had like pretty much all of the requirements of the Right to Education Act. Like it had uh, physical facilities, it had a, a, a working, uh, like a working water pump, it had bathrooms that were functioning. Uh, it had all of the sort of uh, inputs that SSA provided, like teaching learning materials and so on. But uh, the school was pretty much defunctional. The teacher would not show up, would have a, had a very poor relationship with the community. And uh, if you talk to uh, state officials uh, about this, uh, what they say is that what we're trying to do in schools like this is encourage more rational planning. Um, so uh, there is an inspection regime uh, that was put in place. So here's the plan. We want to ensure schools are built. And so at the local level, uh, bureaucrats and teachers I talked to basically said they were being pressured to meet these infrastructure targets. And that there was a lot of pressure. Girls' toilets was one of the uh, key policies that was being emphasized at the time of my fieldwork. And it was incredible to see when I entered a school, one of the first things they would show me is that, look, we have a girls' toilet. Uh, and that's partly because that's where the pressure, the pressure was coming to meet and, 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 and you could say achieve compliance with that policy rule. Uh, but complying with that rule did not necessarily uh, respond to what communities want. Uh, so, these, so the same bureaucrats were not willing to work with communities to uh, maybe adjust the infrastructure to better meet their needs. Maybe they wanted, uh, you know, a bigger, uh, uh, like a bigger boundary wall around the school, or maybe they had wanted to uh, change the location of the hand pump. That was not allowed. And so these norms were seen as a way to insulate the agency from this kind of local level interference. Um, and here's a quote from an official uh, who's trying to actually work against the rules. And he's, uh, he says, when I push to do something different, I'm viewed with suspicion. My office will begin to question what is his uh, motive be behind again and again asking for a special concession. Uh, they would think that he must be trying to gain some personal benefit or fida, some gain uh, out of trying to adapt or alter a policy rule. 
Um, an example of, of how that works and weakens quality is uh, from another case study. Uh, this is of an informal settlement from the same state. Uh, so Pratham, uh, the education NGO I had mentioned, they'd organized residents in this, uh, in this slum. So uh, Agra district, uh, that's where the Taj Mahal is, is located, uh, has an area where there's a lot of migrants who've come into that district. Uh, and here, uh, there, there's no legal mandate to provide education in these informal settlements. And the problem is that if you provide a school, then you end up legally recognizing that settlement. And so there's already, you could see a mismatch between what the formal law will want and what the community actually needs. And so this is a quote from a, a district official saying that we tried repeatedly, but nothing can be done and we have to work according to guidelines that were given to us. And uh, the main concern was that they can't change the rules on behalf of just one community. If we start making these exceptions, every informal community is going to start asking us for a school and we're going to be kicked out of our jobs essentially. So there's a deep concern that if I'm responsive to these community demands, I'm seen as a bad bureaucrat. Now, some comparative findings from Himachal Pradesh. So uh, the interesting thing about Himachal Pradesh, this is the, the state that I'd opened up with uh, at, the, at the outset. Um, this state actually was one of India's least literacy, lowest literacy states at independence. So it was among the bottom five uh, in terms of literacy. Um, and it, from weak, very weak initial conditions, it developed to becoming a leader in primary education. I think this is interesting because when we look at other states where we, uh, that have gotten a lot of attention in academic literature, particularly states like Kerala or states like Tamil Nadu in the South, these are states that actually historically already had a lead in education. Uh, they also had a very different caste composition that, that enabled uh, uh, social groups at the bottom of the caste hierarchy to make demands on the state. And so the kind of initial conditions here were far worse. And actually, Himachal Pradesh wasn't even a state until 1971. It was just being administered by the central government, essentially. So you have a, a set of conditions that you think would really push against uh, 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 higher uh, quality service delivery. Yet you see by the 1990s, you begin to see some indications and really by the early 2000s that begins to uh, become much clearer in the data that not only does the state have higher rates of enrollment, but it's also doing a lot better in terms of the quality of services. Uh, and one of the, 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 the factors that, that comes out uh, in my field work at least is that community participation around schooling is much more robust and in particular, I look at the role of women's associations and villages. So these are Mahila Mandals, and I'll say a bit about them, but they have a history of working around uh, uh, areas outside of education, like, uh, like forestry or, or natural resource management. Uh, in a nutshell, what I find in Himachal Pradesh is that the state was much more capable in seeing these groups as potential partners in service delivery, and then empowering them to actually monitor schools. Um, now, one aspect of this is the, is the fact that lower level officials in Himachal Pradesh were, were going through a process of learning uh, uh, from their senior officials. So uh, this is just a quote from an official who learned to kind of coordinate with marginalized groups and, and talks about his own career in the bureaucracy. So when he started in, in 1986, uh, uh, you know, the poor wouldn't come to his office for help and there was hesitation. And uh, he learned by watching the example of his seniors, as he describes in the quote, uh, that if uh, his senior uh, senior official began to shun people, he would be doing the same thing. But those he worked under encouraged him to keep his door open. So this just is one of many examples from the book of officials learning. And so there's a process of learning where frontline officials learn from senior officials. And I'll sh as I'll show later on in this presentation, uh, citizens and societal groups also then learn from lower level officials. So there's a process where norms actually get transmitted down this hierarchy. Um, I'll give an example of how deliberation unfolds in Himachal Pradesh and how it ends up impacting education uh, in, in terms of services. So uh, this is a, a school that I visited. It's far flung. Uh, you can see it's surrounded by hills. Uh, it's very difficult to monitor these schools. If you're sitting in the state capital of Shimla, you cannot possibly be monitoring every one of these schools yourself. So you often need to find other means. Uh, and what uh, Himachal Pradesh did was uh, start to build these informal planning meetings. And these were called participatory meetings in my interviews with officials, because they were not only uh, 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 you know, state bureaucrats in these meetings, 
but there were elected officials, so your local, what's called a, an MLA, a member of the Legislative Assembly. So this is kind of a, a local state legislator, but also civil society groups. So groups that have a history of working in Himachal Pradesh around uh, things like forestry were invited to these meetings. And what these meetings revealed to state officials was that actually there's a lot of local level knowledge that they could harness in the process of implementation. So I'll give an example uh, of, uh, of the adaptation that took place around district calendars. So if you go to most states in India, there's a, a given uh, a set of uh, weeks when exams take place. Uh, they can often happen in April or May. Uh, and it happens so that in this part of India, uh, that period coincides often with the harvest season. And in the harvest season, children end up working on the farm with their parents. So this is the reality that children may not be attending school for the months leading up to their exams. And so basically the timing is setting children up to fail, particularly those from weaker social uh, backgrounds. Uh, what Himachal Pradesh did was seeing this, learning about this from uh, local level officials, but also from uh, civil society groups, they gave districts flexibility to change the calendar for their exams based on the weather conditions in each district. So each district could alter the timing of the exam when, whenever the prevailing uh, time came for the harvest. And uh, being located in, you know, in, in the Himalayas, that actually varies a lot by elevation. So having that variation actually, or that flexibility, gave districts an opportunity to ensure that children could actually succeed in those exams. Another example, and I open up with this in the book actually, was that um, uh, meeting the, the very kind of particular needs of certain subsects of the community. So there's a community of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of citizens in Himachal Pradesh called the Gujar, and the Gujar are nomadic. Uh, they rear buffalo and they, uh, they move between places. And as you can imagine, this isn't great for kids' education because they can, can't stay in one school. They'll go from uh, the hills uh, in the summer down to the plains in the winter and back up. Uh, so what uh, Himachal Pradesh's bureaucracy did was they, they, they experimented. They learned about uh, what was happening with the Gujar, that they were actually moving up and down, and they actually created mobile schools. So they hired teachers outside of the standard uh, process uh, through the civil service exam. Uh, there were often Gujars themselves uh, who were educated a bit more and attached them to uh, a group that was moving uh, between the plains and the hills. And in that process, they provided education through these mobile schools. Uh, consequently, the teachers that provided this were, were, were given opportunities to get trained and then eventually get civil service protection. But you could not possibly imagine doing this in other Indian states where uh, seeing uh, even the process of teacher recruitment is, so, is, is full of conflict that if you don't meet uh, the requirement like having a BA at a bachelor's of education, you cannot even possibly imagine going into that process of, of then becoming a teacher. Uh, this was a state that was willing to kind of look at local level solutions and then bring them into the state. So now there's a, a basically a process for volunteer teachers to get graduated into the civil service uh, uh, um, exam and then become official teachers. But I guess most importantly for this community, it, it meant that their children could actually get education and retain their, their, their form of life. Let me finish the sort of findings with this last example I had opened up with. So this is uh, the village I had uh, described at the outset that was uh, uh, a far-flung village, uh, primarily consisting of lower castes, Right, um, it was uh, heterogeneous and relatively poor. Um, here I found a relatively well-functioning primary school. Um, the book provides some indicators of that, uh, but essentially uh, the school had a, a pretty good teacher to pupil ratio. Uh, Midday meal was being provided and uh, really interestingly, the parents were so happy with the school. Uh, they said that private schools have tried to open up in their area, but they don't succeed because no one wants to use them. They, they have that much faith in the school. And I, I found the source of that faith, and that faith came partly, of course, from what I argue, bureaucracy, but also non-state non actors. So I don't know if you can see it so well, uh, but this is, uh, this is a Mahila Mandal. This is a women's association from that village that had a history of managing uh, local resources. And over time, this group became involved in education. Um, and in some sense, this is not just a story about this particular village and this group, but actually a larger policy that emerged in Himachal Pradesh, where these informal women's groups uh, be, uh, became recognized by the state. And it became the only state in India to actually uh, vest uh, what are called mother teacher associations with authority. 
Now, this becomes really important in India, particularly this part of India, given patriarchal norms. Uh, often men might be away from a village. They might be earning income uh, in, in, in the cities and sending it back. So when women are uh, engaging with, the, with public administration in this part of India, uh, they're often sent away. They often ask, well, who is your husband? In fact, uh, it'll often be the case that the, hus that the father's name is written next to the child's name on, on any of the enrollment forms in the school. And then the mother is actually disempowered from, from participating in decision-making around the school. So this recognition of, of, of women in this part of India is actually quite relevant. And I don't want to go into the details of the process for how it was this took place, but essentially it was through some of the, the participatory meetings I mentioned earlier, where civil society groups had been working with, 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 with these women's associations around a host of other uh, uh, policy areas. And then they began experimenting with the state. So piloting these MTAs in certain places and finding that actually they were very uh, engaged in school management. Um, and so training sessions were undertaken with these groups and that gave these groups some confidence that the state is trying to build their capabilities to actually monitor. And this is a quote from an official that just shows the learning process that took place, that over the course of expanding schooling, they found we found that women contribute more uh, to the primary school. And I think this is important because it suggests that actually the process of implementation uh, is in itself a process of learning. Uh, in, in the process of, uh, of providing a public good, uh, when you uh, interact with the community, you might learn better ways of providing it. And in this case, having a more deliberative setup inside the state allows you to take that knowledge, integrate it, and then reform internally. So the policies were changed over time to, uh, to give women much more say over um, local service delivery. So I think I'm, I'm reaching towards the end of my time. Would that be fine? Uh, and I, I'd be happy to take questions. So I, I'm going to skip this. I have a, uh, yet another state uh, I can share more about, but, but why don't I just jump to uh, some concluding implications? Um, for one, um, a lot of the literature uh, on, the, on uh, the state and human development in India has looked at spending, uh, or it's looked at at the micro level and, uh, and, and, and really the preferred approach has been in development economics in particular to use RCTs to find ways to intervene and then test uh, the, the impact of a particular intervention on outcomes. Um, these are two of the books uh, that were written by, by Nobel laureates in economics that have uh, come out of India. Um, and and uh, you know, they reach interestingly similar conclusions, but they approach the state through different uh, uh, sides. So Amartya Sen very famously uh, has, has uh, talked about the importance of public deliberation, but it's often talking about elite agencies within the state and the need for the state to, assemb to assimilate information at the top. Uh, 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 scholars like, like, like Duflo and, and Abhijit Banerjee have looked at the local level, very, very local level, and tried to find what works for service delivery. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's not enough to look at the top and to look at the kind of micro level, you have to look at this meso level, the transmission mechanism of policy from the elite agency down to the frontline state, down to the school. And in fact, as you go down this gradient of uh, power in politics becomes more and more important. And this is really uh, the domain where I try to make a contribution is that uh, often uh, the challenge of implementation is, is seen as uh, you know, this, this, um, this uh, missing link between policy design and tangible outcomes. Um, a lot has been written about uh, India's elite bureaucracy, the IAS, and then the local bureaucracy is seen as weak and politicized. And this has then led uh, to, uh, to privatization, not just of education, but health and even security. Um, just as an aside, I'm working on policing right now, and it, it might surprise some of you or maybe not, that uh, the size of private security in India is something like eight to 10 times the size of India's police and standing army combined. Uh, that gives you a sense of the, the, the exit from, from public sector institutions that's been taking place. But I suggest we actually can try to rethink the state in India. If we think about it as not just a, a single unitary actor, there's actually varieties of bureaucracy across India, right? So if you look at the academic literature on the state in India, going back from, from Gunnar Murdahl in the 1960s, um, all the way up to Lang Pritchett at the Blavatnik School, uh, more recently, uh, you see the Indian state has acquired a lot of nice adjectives, right, over the decades. Um, and uh, th these, these adjectives really begin with this assumption that there's, that there's uh, one uh, uh, 
appropriate and true form of bureaucracy and any divergence from it is seen as a sign of weakness. And I think that we need to move beyond this dichotomy of strong versus weak to really investigate the varieties of bureaucracy. And there, I've only identified two, there could be many more. Uh, and, and, and perhaps what we need to do is think about alternative uh, uh, forms of bureaucracy. And the way that we can do that is by unpacking their everyday practices and importantly, their relations with citizens uh, on the ground. Um, so to wrap up uh, some of the big picture you could say findings or points or uh, hopefully contributions of the book. Uh, one is that uh, where bureaucracy is uh, comparatively weak or politicized uh, uh, and formal institutions seem uh, ineffective, uh, informal norms nonetheless matter and they impact how bureaucracies work. Uh, societal feedback is really important. So it's not only about uh, state action, it's societal action, but how effective society is is still conditional on whether or not frontline bureaucrats actually understand society as a partner in their policy mandates. And here, I think uh, I would say uh, from the field work I've done for this book, that bureaucracy that's deliberative is actually better placed to integrate societal input, particularly when society is so unequal as it is in rural India, because they create more inclusive platforms uh, for citizens to participate. Now, just to be clear, deliberation is not a panacea. Uh, deliberative fora can also get captured by elites. But when a bureaucracy is oriented towards participation, they're more likely to provide uh, opportunities to counter uh, uh, elite capture. Um, and so last point uh, is here that I think when I try to position this book in relation to kind of understanding social services and, uh, and the politics of social welfare more broadly, I think part of this shows that norms impact services and the quality of education but very importantly, it also impacts society and how society sees the state. And as a consequence, uh, how citizenship itself gets practiced. So if I'm part of a group uh, and I feel that I have, a, a, that my collective action is likely to get a response and achieve something and, uh, and, and produce a desired outcome, I might be more willing later on to support the state in its policy endeavors. Uh, and as a consequence, services can improve, uh, but I might feel uh, uh, you know, more of a part of the public service domain. Um, so I think I'm just gonna end there. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have about the book. Um, and also if uh, there, there's some other examples I can give, there's also some comparative implications I mentioned for other places. Um, which I'm happy to discuss as well. Thank you. Thanks. Sure, sure. I can do that. Thank you. For those who don't know about political economy, that was a whistle stop introduction to political economy. And for those who don't know about India, a whistle stop introduction to India's education system. Uh, but also very importantly about bureaucracy, which I think many of us have to interact with in our attempt to get good ideas into classrooms. Um, shall we start with questions? Pam, Pam you would like to give a little bit of your, of your own work. I've ah, spoken a bit about it with Akshay, but yeah. Well, I'm a, an emeritus professor here, but I've been involved in school effectiveness and school improvement research for more than 40 years now, um, but not in India. So it's absolutely fascinating to hear about this and the challenges. My only um, comment was perhaps a little sadness and surprise that where you had um, the success of a Dalit female elected, you would have thought there would have been a stronger recognition of marginalized groups, community, and presumably she was elected because she was popular and therefore community groups <coughs> were, were um, you know, voting for her. Um, but in Uttar Pradesh, that seemed not to then link to better delivery or more participative engagement, but actually you mentioned the words pushback. And I just wondered why that might've been the case, whereas in another area where you didn't have somebody from a, a very marginalized and power, powerless group achieving um, elective representative stage and why, why that might be, because you might have thought with her there, or was it that people didn't like her there? She was a female, she was marginal from a, a low caste group, and therefore the bureaucracy sort of tried to hamper her efforts, because presumably she would have wanted better services in education for, because her whole mantra you mentioned was dignity, which 
Yeah. So I thought, well, that that was strange that that didn't help. <laughs> yeah. Uh, should, should I? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So, please, please. Thank you. By the way, this is a really important question, and it's something I wanted to get at in my fieldwork. So it's not only about uh, her being chief minister. I actually selected the district uh, for exactly this reason from from where her education minister came. So this was the district not only where she had a big constituency, but she appointed her education minister from this very same district. And there was a direct line uh, between uh, school teachers, uh, local village heads, and access to the highest level of the education system. Yet, nonetheless, you see this outcome. Uh, but so it sounds that, participative when you put it like that. Well, well, direct, direct line. Well, well, a direct line. Meaning that, at least politically, you could you could express yourself right. in this area. Uh, but let me say a couple of things. I mean, your, your your question, I guess, it touches on two things. One is, it points to the fact that change in leadership alone mm -hmm. may not render a, a massive change in bureaucratic norms, and I think that's an important observation in itself. Uh, that doesn't, to any way, say that one ought not to aim to have such a person in power. But just just to say that it's insufficient. And one reason it's insufficient is for what is, is uh, for the reason you actually mentioned, there's still a remarkable amount of resistance uh, with inside the state, but in society as well. So in, in, in one of the villages I visited in Uttar Pradesh, um, I remember, uh, I, I, I'll never forget a conversation uh, with a Dalit man who said that, uh, you know, uh, being a Dalit and seeing her elected made me feel I have recognition. He said, I have pehchan. Like, I, I didn't have it before. Now I have it. Uh, the upper caste in the village felt very differently about that. That yeah, actually, no this is this is you know this group can you know they're they're just on a spree to spread their own symbols, political symbols. So she was building statues and having parks that were uh, uh, expressing you could say Dalit pride uh, uh, for this historically disadvantaged group. And you know the politics of statues, by the way, we see everywhere. <laughs> right now, yeah. right? So I think there's something important about that moment. About the dignity. But within the bureaucracy. She was seen, not just her, but other officials, politicians generally are, are generally distrusted, uh, you know, by the bureaucracy. And it could be that she focused on those policies where she could make the biggest difference right away. So she invested a lot on police, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, one, one, one uh, reaction I got when I talked to senior officials was that one difficulty in education was that it's much harder to alter the, the, the sort of education bureaucracy than even the police bureaucracy, because it's much more directly under the control of the chief minister. And in fact, for her, uh, her um, um, constituency, being mistreated by the police and violence against her constituency was a more immediate yeah, uh, concern. So, you know, the big what if is, what if she had another term or two terms? Right, uh, because uh, had that happened, possibly one might have seen. I mean, the push for girls' toilets came directly from. Her. Yeah. So that was something that you know people call it the terror of the girls' toilet in our area. We have to have it and make sure it's there. So, in some sense, political will doesn't on its own translate. And I think that's where norms play some role. Well, the girls' you know, toilets a big issue in Africa too. I mean, yes. I. I haven't studied India, but I've mm -hmm. had students who've studied in Africa and, mm -hmm. and you know, the girls not attending schools because of a lack of facilities is, is right. a huge issue. Right. So you can see why it became a bandwagon, but but of a practical value, but clearly was unpopular or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the other, I guess, you know, related point uh, to make is that even if she had a lot of... Uh, had put a lot of political will, and actually, I mean, my reading is that her political party didn't take on education as a core issue. Uh, there were a number of other things that was taken on, but education wasn't central to it. Uh, had she taken on education, she still would need to build those inroads to the frontline bureaucracy, which were really walled off uh, from, from the political class. So you had individual politicians at the local level trying to influence the, the frontline bureaucracy. But it wasn't at all in a coherent way around policy. It was really about individual sort of uh, 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 you know, goodies from my constituency yeah. rather than broad public goods. And in one term, you mentioned she didn't get another term. So you I mean, couldn't affect much you know, change. Five years, we're just trying yeah. to hang on to power. You know, it's very tough. Thank you. Yeah. Very fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. So um, there's lots of ways in which I, I can see that there's no, there's no Nobel Prize in politics, unfortunately. But I mean, you, you do some interesting stuff here that gives us some real insights into, into the, 
in some of your particular work, and, and I really like the way you've actually, you know, you've read your anthropology and you've read your history, which is, feels really important here. So I want to ask you about the history of this thing, yeah. because you, you mentioned in the book about the first minister being, in, in, you know, it's, it's obviously a state which, you know, it, it feels on the margins of, of Indian, Indian politics, but therefore also has a very strong sense of civic pride and kingdoms. Mm. And obviously the first ministers are important as well. Mm -hmm. And he, he, the way you describe it is he sets a, sets a vision for how to create a deliberative democracy. Yeah. So, so then the question is, how much, you know, in order to understand how bureaucracies change, you know, how, to what extent do we, do we need to do that sort of historical, like, historical work to be done? Yeah. And I think, I think that, that seems a really interesting sort yeah. of tactic, but also insight. And then my other question is, given what you've learned, or given, given the comparative data that we now have on these, why is the IAS not rethinking how it works? Because surely the IAS, they, they circle it around the country, surely they can see as they move where, where, where it's working and where it's not. I mean, how out of touch are they? Or is, it, is the IAS more about looking after the IAS than really working with local bureaucrats? Right. Uh, how about I begin with the first? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I actually didn't uh, present this, but I actually have um, a section of the book which is on the historical origins. Uh, could say propagation of norms over time and why is it they persist over time and th this part of the book is historical and kind of goes into the political history um, leaders matter but less so individual leaders and more so leadership so their style of leading and their interactions with the bureaucrats so i look at key moments of state formation so there's a literature on state building and state capacity and the literature from europe really is focused on war and the need to amass resources and build bureaucracies. So, so Charles Tilly famously says that uh, that uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, you know war created the state and state created war, something of that uh, along those lines. In India, it was actually much more about uh, uh, a federal state and uh, the fiscal and political relationship between state and and, and the central government, and where uh, the central government was was very dependent on state governments for political power. In those places, you actually ended up finding that politicians and bureaucrats were really competing for authority to get up the, the, the hierarchy and move to New Delhi. So your IES officer in Lucknow, the capital of UP, was aiming to become cabinet secretary. And so they had much more of an incentive in some sense to reinforce legalism in the process of state formation. Himachal Pradesh is a very different set of relationships between uh, the state uh, political and, and bureaucratic leadership in the center. Himachal Pradesh was financially unviable when it began because it's in it's in the Himalayas. It could not fund itself. Uh, it, it's one of those states that now is called a special category state where it gets fiscal transfers from the center. So it depended on the center for money. And it's also meaningless to the center in terms of votes because it's not as big politically. So in some sense, that created the conditions for collective action between bureaucrats and politicians. So that part of my argument is really historical. I think we have to really look at the concrete politics of state formation across time to make sense of where norms come from and why they propagate. Um, so that's hopefully gives you a flavor of an answer to that. On the IES, it's so amazing. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with this. Uh, I mean, I, they're, they're wonderful people. I know many of them uh, from these states where I did my field work, but they are a separate class category unto themselves. So they're nationally recruited, unlike the state civil service, uh, they have, uh, you know, the, the best, you could say, uh, perks and so on and so forth. I wouldn't say they're all out of touch. There is a, uh, some that definitely think that, you know, because I'm IAS, I've come through this very difficult exam, which, by the way, is much harder than the exam says to get into Oxford. Or it's like, you know, tiny, tiny proportion of, uh, of aspirants ever make it to the interview, let alone get. But... There is a sense among many of them that we're the best, and uh, yet there are some that do spend time out in the field, so I don't think it's a uniform matter. Uh, but this thing about um, a reform of the IAS, this came up several times uh, throughout independence, and I think uh, that the, the sort of pressure is to keep things as they are because people are very concerned about losing that prestige and losing their powerful position. So there have been attempts to have lateral entry from the private sector, for example, into the IAS. There have been attempts to graduate state civil servants into the elite national civil service, and there's pressures against that because you want to maintain power. And part of what I want to suggest when I say why norms are so sticky is that they actually end up serving the interests of those who are powerful. Um, so that's very interesting. Yeah.
Uh, hello, um, I'm doing my master's in higher education here. Mm -hmm. um, and we also deal with bureaucracies, but in a very different way. Uh, because we are because like higher education is probably not a primary right in the same sense as primary education is um and so i'm like more uh, i find your work quite interesting and thank you for bringing for this amazing presentation and talking to us about like this possibility of varieties of bureaucracies that exist and i find that contribution to knowledge very very valuable um and so uh, what i wanted to ask you about is this uh, about your comparison that you said with with china um, and how that kind of like impacts it because like from my understanding um i think uh, it, it seems to me that the, in deliberative democracies there's a, there's a lot of like individual initiative being taken at like really like local levels um and like i find that similar things happen in china the reason is because like there is like a state signaling system where like uh, there is this idea that if, if you are a local level um, bureaucrat and if you go, went ahead and took on a risk to try out something new and if it kind of like pays off, then you have like high rewards in terms of your mobility within the career, uh, within your political career in China and like CPC is more likely to support you in, in that instance. So I'm just like trying to see if they are say, similar or other incentive mechanisms that exist within, say, either deliberative bureaucracies, or if these like incentive mechanisms are not working within rule-based uh, bureaucracies, that also kind of influence the ground-level working and implementation of these yeah. policies. Fantastic question. And so, I mean, I'll begin by saying, I, you know, I'm not a China expert. So what I say is based on secondary uh, literature and my reading of it, and uh, you know. So yeah, please take that as the, that caveat. I do have a comparative chapter in the book, and I I do look at China partially because uh, there's there's I mean maybe surprising for me it was that there's a a long history of of, of deliberation in China. Uh, so I mean this is prior to Mao, but my reading from political theory coming out of China was that actually Mao uh, had um, he he actually cited John Dewey quite a bit uh, in this notion of pragmatism. Uh, and so experimentation, trial and error, uh, very much central to how he worked and how other political leaders work. But within the bureaucracy itself, the other thing I found fascinating uh, is that if you take a step back, you tend not to associate deliberation with, 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 with authoritarian regimes. And in the literature on deliberate democracy really keeps the democracy together with deliberation. But if you look inside the Chinese state, there's many more spaces for deliberation. I would. Uh, hypothesized than in, in the Indian state. And uh, one thing is that, the, like you were mentioning, the sort of signaling systems and the mechanisms of deliberation between levels of the Chinese state. So China, for those who may be less familiar, is one of the most decentralized countries in the world in terms of local public finance, the provision of public goods, uh, and then uh, decision making. And so there are opportunities to actually, as one, one China scholar who uh, uh, who uh, I've uh, taken some classes with as a graduate student, as she puts it, that people don't talk about policy making, uh, sorry, by policy implementation by bureaucracy at the front line. They say that's policy making. They're taking policy, actually making it on the ground. They have that much discretion at the local level. So that might create some conditions that facilitate this example that you're giving of local level uh, officials. Uh, trying to experiment. Um, the work, I don't know if you've come across the work by um, by political scientist Yuan Yuan Ang. Uh, she has a book called, uh, it's called uh, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. And she developed a theory. Uh, she also has, a, has a, an article associated with a book called Beyond Vapor. And she tries to argue that the Chinese bureaucracy is another ideal type. She calls it directed improvisation, where the central party state is, uh, is, is is guiding, setting broad guidelines and, and the local, so provincial and local level officials are improvising and those experiments that do poorly get stamped out very quickly and those that do well get, uh, you know, get, get lauded and then eventually can get scaled up uh, at the national, uh, well at least at the subnational level, maybe the national level. To do that you need a bureaucracy that can communicate, uh, you know, by comparison, uh, my uh, IAS, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you could say, uh, you know, the people who are respondents in my interviews, they said uh, one quote is that India is the graveyard of pilots, uh, where there's these attempts and none of them get scaled up because there's no recognition for the official who comes up with this. So there isn't the system in place. So it could be that a bureaucracy that's so wedded to demonstration of, uh, of rule compliance is somehow not able to identify better and worse uh, performance 
because it's not about uh, uh, you know experimentation. It's about rule compliance, and so that's easier to measure. And so what you end up doing, in my my sense from talking to bureaucrats, it actually dampens the motivation to try things. Uh, and so you won't get as, as many experiments, and fewer of them will reach like a higher level of government to get scaled up. Yeah. While we wait, I have a question. So my sense was that one of the reasons for resistance to reform and change was not just about not recognizing the pilots that have succeeded, but having a having no sense of evidence informed policy making. So what is your sense of the relationship of the bureaucracy to evidence building and evidence briefs that can be provided to them. Right. Yeah, so a couple of things on that. Uh, I mean, one is that when you say evidence-based policy making, from the perspective of a public agency, the question is whose evidence? Uh, particularly from, the, from, from Indian public administration, there's a tendency not to trust externally uh, uh, produced information. So even today, we're now in January 2023, the, the 2021 census of India has not been released. This is produced by Indian agencies. Forget about uh, an external agency that's, that's producing data on, on the economy and so on. So there's, there's, there's a tendency to have a kind of, uh, you could say an arm's length you know, kind of distance. You want to keep some distance from that information, so the, the you know what evidence gets brought in is really important. Who they are and if they're seen as official, and I think that's one of the big problems. Where you might have something that appears to be evidence-based policy, but what it is is the state is just kind of producing its own evidence that's anyway uh, uh, helping it reach its conclusions, which it already had before the evidence even came out. And so I'm a bit concerned about that link. Um, and the other part of I guess evidence-based policy making is, you know. Part of it comes to down to trust. Uh, so if you if you if you think about evidence that frontline officials have, so you talk to teachers, you talk to uh, local level education bureaucrats, they might have evidence that they've garnered through all their experience in the field. Are there opportunities for them to vocalize this and then influence policy through that? And even there, I think there isn't there. There's a fear, perhaps, or there's a distrust that this is good evidence or reliable evidence, and so who becomes the adjudicating authority right over that so it's not just about i think the current fashion of evidence-based policy making is that there's you know evidence sits say or evidence producers sit in oxford and we go to india or or maybe in new delhi and you go to the rural parts of india and you generate evidence and what does the policy maker do with that but even within the state and even between levels of the state there seems to be a, a kind of breakdown in that transmission process from evidence to policy yeah thank you any other questions? Or oh, we have the opportunity to stop here and we can all go into the cafe where we'll have an informal meeting there and you can ask questions to our speaker. But I'd like to end by thanking you for an excellent presentation and for thanking you for your questions. Thank you for accepting our invitation to give us a public lecture. Please come with us for some drinks and I'd like to invite all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much.